Okay, good afternoon everyone and welcome to today's uh, lunchtime webinar from Energy Futures Lab. My name is Conor McNally, I'm the Communications Manager at the Institute and I'm very happy to uh, welcome you here uh, today to our webinar with uh, Dr. Robert Hoy from the Department of Materials. Uh, Robert is a lecturer and Royal Academy of Engineering Research Fellow at the Department of Materials here at Imperial College. He leads the Energy Materials, um, the Energy Materials and Devices Group uh, which focuses on the development of thin film semiconductors for clean energy conversion. Uh, Dr. Hoy completed his PhD at the University of Cambridge in 2014 before working as a postdoctoral research associate at MIT between 2015 and 2016. He returned to Cambridge as a college research fellow in 2016 and from 2018 he took up the Royal Academy of Engineering Research Fellowship initially at Cambridge before moving here to Imperial College as a lecturer in January of this year. So we're very happy to have Robert with us today for the webinar. Before we uh, turn to the presentation, just a quick word about how the webinar will work. Robert's going to speak for around 30 minutes or so. After that, there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions. To do that, use the Q&A box, which you'll find on the right-hand side of your screen to submit a question. And just put your name and uh, your question in the text box and send it to us. And uh, just be aware that this event is being recorded. So if you're not uh, comfortable with your name being read out, you can submit those questions anonymously. So with that, I'm going to pass over now uh, to Robert for today's webinar. All right, thank you very much, Connor, for the uh, kind introduction. And also thank you to those of you who have, have attended for attending today's talk. I realize that this is a, we're in the middle of a very busy term. So as Connor mentioned, I'm a lecturer based at the uh, materials department here at Imperial. And I lead a group that works on uh, developing energy materials and their applications and devices for clean energy conversion. And broadly speaking, we have three main areas of research. So we work on defect tolerant semiconductors, and these are materials that can achieve low non rated recombination rates despite high densities of defects. And what that means is that you can make materials that can be efficient even when they're fabricated using simple and cheap uh, growth methods. We also work on developing scalable methods to uh, synthesize novel materials and we specialize in solution and vapor based growth methods. And we work on applying these materials into devices. And today's talk, you'll be hearing about our work on photovoltaics, um, but we also work on tandem solar cells as well as light emitting diodes and a range of other devices as well. If you want to find out more about what we do in our work what, and, and who's in our team, I encourage you to have a look at our group website. So in case I run short of time at the end, I just want to start with um, acknowledgements of the people who contributed to the work that I'll be sharing with you today. And in particular, I'd like to thank Tamida Huck and Rob Yucht, who are two of the PhD students that um, I've been co-supervising. I also like to thank Felix Deschler, as well as his postdoc, Lissa, who took the transient absorption measurements that you see today. And I'd like to thank Vladan Stevanovic and Rachel Kirchen, who did the um, defect calculations in today's talk. And towards the end of this talk, I'll be sharing with you our recent work on indoor photovoltaics. And this project was a collaboration between us and with uh, Vincenzo Pecunia's group based at Suzhou University in China. And finally, I'd like to thank our sponsors, so particularly the Royal Academy of Engineering, as well as Downing College and the Isaac Newton Trust. All right, so let's make a start. So I'm sure a lot of you are aware that we have legislation in the UK um, to reach net zero carbon emissions by 2050. And this is an upgrade from the previous target, which was an 80% reduction compared to emissions in, the in, in 1990. And, but you can see from this plot here that even an 80% reduction is going to require a lot of aggressive efforts from all of us to um, cut you know, emissions in, these, in the various different sectors. For example, if you look at the red boxes here, red bars here, you can see that even to just achieve an 80% reduction, we need to almost completely decarbonize the power generation sector. 
And in 2019, the UK Committee on Climate Change published their report as uh, shown here, and they outlined their further ambition scenario, which was a 96% reduction in CO2 by 2050. And one of the requirements for this further ambition scenario was to increase the um, amount of renewable energy by, uh, by a factor of four. And of course, going beyond this and getting towards net zero by 2050 requires us to go beyond these um, targets. So as you can see, there's a significant uh, need to increase our investment and accelerate the deployment of renewable um, energy sources. And in this webinar series, you've heard about uh, wind power, but um, another important source of renewable energy are photovoltaics. And recently, the Henry Royce Institute um, put together a roadmap on various different technologies that are needed for us to achieve our net zero uh, carbon emissions target. And one of the key technologies are photovoltaics. And that's because the solar resource is vast and it's ubiquitous across, across the world. If this block here were to represent the amount of terrestrial solar energy we, we receive, this will be 10 to the 8 terawatt hours per year. And that's four orders of magnitude larger than the amount of electricity the world needs. Despite that, photovoltaics only make a very small contribution to all the electricity generated worldwide. In the UK, photovoltaics is only 3% of all electricity generated. So there's a lot of potential to accelerate the deployment of solar cells and increase our use of this renewable source of energy. Another energy challenge in the near future will be the fact that a lot of devices will be small and autonomous devices which all connect with each other and they're part of this ecosystem called the Internet of Things. For example, in the future you may be wearing your clothing with some sensors that track your fitness and which may communicate with your home to tell your home when to switch on the lights and start boiling the water. And it's, it's, it's expected that by 2025, there'll be 75 billion devices part of this Internet of Things ecosystem. And many of these devices will be you know, small and uh, autonomous devices, such as wireless sensors. And a lot, in a lot of cases, these devices will be in, in locations where it's not really practical to charge to connect them to the grid. For example, they may be on the outside of buildings, they may be on your ceiling, or they may be you know, in, in a tree. So we need to have a you know, portable source of, of energy to power these devices. And maybe the first thing you'll think about is to power these devices using batteries. And that, that certainly will work, but if we go beyond a certain number of devices, and a certain level of complexity in this IoT ecosystem, it no longer becomes practical to use batteries for every single de um, autonomous device. And some people predict that if we, um, some people predict that if we relied solely on um, batteries um, for, to power all these devices, we would limit 80% of the potential of IoT from being realized. So we need to have alternative sources of uh, portable energy that's will, that will last uh, for a longer period of time. And ideally, will last for the entire lifetime of the device itself. And one of those options is to use a solar cell. And of course, many of these devices will be located indoors, inside our homes, inside our workplaces. So we need to be able to harvest the ambient lighting that we have available. So we can use indoor photovoltaics and this plot shows you the power consumption used by various different wireless sensors. And you can see that indoor solar cells are already sufficient to power a large number of these wireless devices already, such as the radio frequency identification tags or Wi-Fi. And the indoor PV market is rapidly growing right now. So the compound annual growth rate for indoor PV is 70%. And that's larger than the growth rate for the wireless sensors market and also larger than the growth of the outdoor PV market as well. So I sh share with you two uh, energy challenges, and, and I, I said that solar cells could play quite an important role in helping us to address those two energy challenges. So what are solar cells and how do they produce electrical power? Well, on the left-hand side here, we have a, um, a structure for a, a typical uh, photovoltaic device stack and usually we will have a light absorber. This is our semiconductor that can absorb light. It's sandwiched between two charged transport layers 
as well as two electrodes. And one of those electrodes needs to be transparent so that we can shine light through it and into the absorber itself. Over here, we have the band diagram for this device stack. And here you see that we have the absorber and over here is the transparent electrode here. So we shine light in through the transparent electrode. We absorb that light and that excites an electron across the band gap, which leaves behind a hole in the valence band. And because these bands are bent, we have an internal electric field within our photovoltaic device that will separate these charges in opposite directions so that we can extract them into the external circuit where they can be used for doing electrical work. So there's lots of different photovoltaic technologies. And the chart here from the National Renewable Energy Lab highlights for you the development of these different materials over time. The most um, widely used material for uh, outdoor solar cells is crystalline silicon, and that's been under development for four decades. But silicon has its own challenges. So that's motivated a lot of groups around the world to identify alternative materials to silicon. And their development is highlighted in this bottom right corner here. So if we zoom into this, what you can see is that one of the fastest developing technologies are represented by these yellow circles here, and these are lead halo perovskite solar cells. Perovskite solar cells were first reported in 2009, and in 2019, they reached 25% efficiency. And that is more efficient than multi-crystalline silicon and nearly as efficient as monocrystalline silicon. And what's remarkable about this is that this was achieved in just one decade, whereas silicon was developed for four decades. So this is what a perovskite is. So here we have a typical lead halo perovskite device stack, and this is very similar to the, to the device stack that I showed you earlier in the slides. If we zoom in on the material itself, here we, you can see the crystal structure of a lead halo perovskite. So perovskite refers to a family of materials with the same crystal structure, and the stoichiometry is ABX3. So in this case, the b site cation is lead, and each of these lead cations is coordinated with six halides, which could be iodized, for example. And these lead um, halide octahedra share corners to form this cubic unit cell. And to keep this whole structure together, we have this large a site cation, and this could be, for example, methamonium. What's really unusual about the perovskites is that they can be made using very simple fabrication methods. So for example, most perovskites are made just by solution processing, and that's where you make a precursor solution containing lead iodide and methamonium iodide. You spread the solution over your substrate, spin coat it, and then anneal, and you have a very nice perovskite film. And the 25% efficient perovskite devices are made by the solution processing method. Contrast that to silicon. With silicon, to make the best silicon solar cells, you need to process at above 1000 degrees Celsius. You need to use very uh, complex and expensive equipment and also very clean environments. Whereas with the lead halo perovskites, you can make the best solar cells using equipment that most groups around the world have ready access to. And this has been an important contributing factor to the fast cycle of learning that's been witnessed with the perovskites. And the key enabling factor for this is the defect tolerance of the perovskites. So as I mentioned earlier, defect tolerance means that you can have lots of defects, but still have low non-rated recombination rates. And the model that's being put forward to uh, explain why this occurs is based on the electronic structure. So here on the left-hand side, we have the electronic structure um, for traditional semiconductors, and this could be, for example, silicon or gallium arsenide. And in these materials, the original atomic orbitals hybridize when we form the compound to form a bonding orbital in the valence band and an anti-bonding orbital in the conduction band. And when you form defects, you end up with dangling bonds, which form an energies close to where the original atomic orbitals are. So in this case, we end up with defect states close to the middle of the band gap. And these deep defect states are very harmful to the elect optoelectronic properties. They cause very high rates of irreversible energy losses. By contrast, the perovskites have a very different electronic structure. In this electronic structure, the original atomic orbitals are now close to the band edges rather than in the middle of the band gap. So now when we form defect states, we'll form defect states either resonant within the bands or if they do form within a band gap, they're much more likely to be close to the one of the band edges. 
And we call these shallow defect states, which are much less harmful. So you can have lots of these shallow defect states, but still get quite good performance. And our question is, can we find lead free alternatives that can replicate this defect tolerance and pre primarily form shallow defect states? Because of course, lead is toxic. Um, and also in the case of the perovskites, the lead is present in the highly soluble form, so it's readily accessible. So we want to find lead free and safe alternatives, which can, but which can also replicate this defect tolerance properties. And we hypothesize that this could be found if we can find materials with a similar electronic structure, which may occur if we can find materials with a significant fraction of s orbital electrons in the valence states. We believe that th this is very important for forming this particular electronic structure and getting this antibonding to antibonding orbital transition instead of a bonding to antibonding orbital transition. So because of that, we look towards compounds based on um, partially oxidized P block cations. And one of those cations is bismuth. So bismuth is right next to lead on the periodic table. But ironically, bismuth is a, is a very safe um, element. Um, there's very little evidence for toxicity in bismuth based compounds. And as an example, you would use bismuth oxychloride as over the counter stomach medicine. But the electronic properties are quite similar to lead. So if bismuth forms a stable three plus oxidation state. And then we have an electronic configuration that's very similar to the lead cations. And importantly, we have these valence S2 electrons um, in the bismuth three plus cations. So one of the materials that we thought about is bismuth oxyiodide, and this is not the sort of material you would think about if you were just looking for lead-free perovskites. It doesn't have a perovskite crystal structure. It doesn't have a perovskite stoichiometry. But the reason why we thought this could be promising is because we thought the S2 electrons from the bismuth could lead to this material forming uh, similar features, similar electronic features as the perovskites, which could lend to defect tolerance being achieved. So this material has a you know, layered structure. It's a bit like graphite. We have these layers that which are held together with van der Waals interactions. And the abundance of bismuth is enough for commercialization. According to the US Geological Society, we have 370,000 tons in global reserves of bismuth, and that's much larger than the um, abundance of tellurium. And yet cabin tellurite is one of the most commonly um, sold uh, solar cells in, in the photovoltaic market right now. So we want to investigate bismuth oxyiodide for photovoltaics, and these were our key questions. Is this material defect tolerant? And is it stable in the air? Can we make these into efficient solar cells? And if we can, is there a pathway to build upon our initial device results to achieve future improvements in efficiency? So let's get started with the first question. So we grew bismuth oxyiodide by a chemical vapor deposition, and this was done using a tube furnace. So we have a horizontal tube held within a furnace, and we're heating up um, a crucible containing bismuth iodide powders. So this is heated to 360 degrees Celsius, and the vapor is reacted with oxygen, which is flowed through this reactor here. And so we form bismuth oxyiodide, and that deposits onto the substrates. So you can see photographs of the material here. So it has a nice red color, and that's because it has a relatively wide band gap of 1.9 electron volts. We left this material in ambient air for 197 days, and we found that there was no change in the diffraction pattern. So this material is phase stable over the entire testing period. Contrast that with methamonium lead ida perovskite. If I were to keep methamonium lead ida perovskite in, in the same conditions, it would degrade after only five days. So bismuth oxyiodide is two orders of magnitude more air stable than methamone lead iodide perovskite. And that's very promising if we want to make photovoltaic devices, which can last ultimately for 25 years. So that, now let's look at the defect tolerance of this material. So first of all, we did some calculations. And for defect calculations, we're particularly interested in a defect formation energy. And that's because the concentration of a defect has an Arrhenius relationship to the defect formation energy. If you have a larger formation energy, you have an exponentially lower concentration of defects. And if you're growing materials at up to 600 degrees Celsius, then as a rule of thumb, if your formation energy is larger than 1.5 EV, then the concentration of that defect is so low, you may as well consider it to not be present. 
So we're only looking for defects where formation energy is below 1.5 eV. Now this defect formation energy depends on the Fermi energy and also on the chemical potentials. So the first thing a theorist would do is they would calculate the phase diagram for the bismuth, oxygen, and iodine system, and they will work out where in this phase space um, we will have bismuth oxyiodides. And that's given by this orange region here. And the defect um, uh, you know, formation energies will be different at different points within this orange space. So we calculated defect diagrams at the four extrema. Now they all they all look, all look quite similar. So I'm just going to show you the defect diagram for point A here. So here we have it at, at um, zero EV Fermi energy. This is where we have our valence band maximum. Over here we have our conduction band minimum. So this white space here is the band gap of our material. And these different lines represent different defects. So for example, this dashed blue line here represents a bismuth vacancy. And the slope of this line represents the charge state of the defect. So a positive slope means that we have a positive charge, and that's a donor defect, which makes the material more n-type. A negative slope is an accepted defect, which makes the material more p-type. And we're looking for the Fermi energies at which we have a change in the slope. And these are called transition levels, and that is where the defect can trap an electron hole and change its charge state. So you can think of these transition levels as being where the trap, traps are present within the band gap. So let's look at the most common defects. So we have bismuth vacancies, iodine vacancies, oxygen iodine antisites, and also oxygen bismuth antisites. And you can see that all four of these defects don't have transition levels within the band gap, except for the bismuth vacancy, but th its transition level forms very close to the valence band maximum. So this agrees with our hypothesis. The defect states in this material are either resonant within the bands or they form very shallow within the band gap. And this will predict that this material would tolerate these vacancy antisite defects that we considered here. So now we want to test this experimentally. And we were, our inspiration for this was um, work done by the National Renewable Energy Lab. And what they did was they, ex they experimentally tested the defect tolerance of the lead halo perovskites. So they kept their perovskite thin films inside an XPS chamber under ultra high vacuum and they sh kept shining um, x-rays at their sample. So over time, that led to a removal of iodine because iodine is very volatile. And with this composition change, they tracked how that affected the electronic structure. And they found that they can reduce the iodine to lead ratio from three originally down to 2.5 before changing the electronic structure. And this is this shows you the, um, the tolerant regime where it's tolerant towards these iodine vacancies and the clusters of these iodine vacancies and that this percent level of tolerance towards these defects is much more than what you will find in a traditional semiconductor where you have to keep these defects at the part per billion level. So we did something similar for bismuth oxyiodide. We kept our bismuth oxyiodide thin films inside a furnace at medium vacuum and we very gently heated it because we didn't want to change the structural properties. We just wanted to induce change it in the uh, composition at the surface. So we annealed it for different periods of time, and straight after annealing, we took it into the XPS chamber straight away to measure the composition and the electronic structure. So here you see that, so the green points are the, iod is the iodine fraction, that you can see that reduces. The orange is bismuth, and that also reduces over time, but not so much as the iodine. And you can also see the oxygen fraction increases. So here we're looking at the um, Fermi level position relative to the valence band. You can see that that remains um, the, the same um, across all these different annealing times, even though we're changing the composition at the surface significantly. I should point out that um, these measurements are all done within the same interaction volume. So they're reflective. Uh, so the composition measurements and the um, electronic structure measurements are correlate with each other directly. And also the core levels for the bismuth remain at exactly the same position. They did become a bit wider, but there was no significant trend in this width with different annealing times. So this shows you that the electronic structure of bismuth oxyiodide is robust against these percent level changes in the surface composition. We now wanted to measure how the composition affected the charge carrier lifetime. And to do this, we uh, use transient absor absorption spectroscopy 
And you can think of this as an absorption measurement that's done with picosecond time resolution. Using this technique, we can track um, the population of excited carriers and how they decay over time. And by measuring the decay in carriers, we saw that the kinetics did not change significantly uh, with a needing time. So even though we're you know, reducing the iodine content you know, by, you know, by with at the percent level, we're not actually reducing the um, charge carrier lifetime. And this again suggests that the optoelectronic properties are robust against these percent level changes in composition. And that again would agree with the hypothesis that this material is defect tolerant. OK, so now we wanted to make photovoltaic devices from this material. And this shows you the structure that we use. So we grew bismuth oxide onto nickel oxide, and there's our whole transport layer. We use zinc oxide as our electron transport layer, and this shows you the cross section of our device stack. Now, our challenge here is that we have a very textured surface for our bismuth oxyiodide. So you can't just spin coat uh, the zinc oxide layer on top. It won't you know, cover this conformally. But we have a, a technique called atmospheric pressure chemical vapor deposition, and this is a reactor that I worked with for a long time. It's a reactor that I'm building in my group right now. And what this does is it, it grows films with the same properties as ALD, but in open air and much faster. So we were able to use this technique to grow zinc oxide conformally to the textured bismuth oxyiodide and completely cover the surface and have a pinhole free layer of zinc oxide. So we optimized the deposition temperature and we got efficiencies up to 1.8%. Now, of course, that's not as high as the perovskites. But it's very good, very promising result as a first result uh, for us. And also the result that we got uh, was more, the devices we made were more efficient than what has been previously reported for this material. And the key reason for this improvement over previous reports was that we were able to grow the material with higher density and um, than, than people were previously were able to. And we measured the current density versus voltage curves in both the forward and reverse directions and you see that those there was no difference between them, which showed that there was no hysteresis in these devices. We then measure the external quantum efficiency, and EQE tells you the fraction of photons of a particular wavelength which are converted to electrons. And these you can see that these EQEs reach up to 80%, which tells us that at this wavelength of 450 nanometers, we can convert 80% of those photons into electrons, which are extracted in our device. And at the time that we published this work, that was the highest reported EQE for bismuth uh, for any bismuth based compounds. And this is very promising because it shows us that at least under short circuit conditions, we, it's possible for us to efficiently extract the photo generated carriers uh, within this material. Now, of course, you know, the efficiency still needs a lot of improvement. Um, and one of the limiting factors is the fact that the band gap is too wide. So remember I showed you earlier the band gap is 1.9 electron volts, and that's too wide for a single junction device. The optimum band gap for a single junction device is 1.3 electron volts. Now you could use bismuth oxyiodide as a top cell in tandem with silicon. So you can make a silicon solar cell, you can make a bismuth oxyiodide solar cell and put that on top, and they can work together uh, to produce more power than each cell can make by themselves. But in order for bismuth oxyiodide to be suitable for these applications, we need to improve the efficiencies up to 15% at least. And so that will take a, a lot of uh, future development. But maybe there's an application we can use these materials in right now um, instead of waiting uh, for you know, future, future improvements. And what we thought about using these for was to harvest indoor lighting. And the reason for this is because for indoor lighting, the optimum band gap is 1.9 electron volts. And that, that's different to, to harvest for materials harvesting the outdoor spectrum because the indoor light spectrum is much narrower. You don't have as much infrared light. And also the indoor light spectrum is concentrated within the visible light range. So here you see um, the EQE spectrum for bismuth oxyiodide that's given by this green curve here, as compared to the spectra for different light sources. So if you look at the, the yellow shaded region, this is the outdoor light spectrum, which is which we call AM 1.5G. And you can see there's lots of this infrared light that won't get absorbed by the bismuth oxyiodide. So that's you know, wasted energy that won't get harvested. By contrast, if we look at the uh, spectrum from um, the white light from white light LED or from 
a fluorescent um, a tube, you can see that this EQE spectrum is a much closer match to that. And these plots here, you also see a, a line for cesium antimony iodide chloride. Um, so this, this is from a, a recent paper, which just um, this week got accepted for publication in advanced energy materials. And in this paper, it's a collaboration between us and the Chesa Pecunius group. And we made the Bismuth octi iodide devices. They made the cesium antimony iodide chloride devices, and we test them together for indoor PV applications. So in the interest of time, I'll only talk about the bismuth oxy iodide. So here we made um, you know, solar cells and we test them initially under um, outdoor lighting. So in this particular case, our device was only about 1% efficient. And this is, so these aren't the best devices that we ever made. Our best devices are doubled in this efficiency. But if we were to make 100 bismuth oxy iodide devices, then the median efficiency is about 1%. So this is close to the average performance of a bismuth oxy iodide solar cell. So this is under outdoor lighting, and now we use the same devices and test them under indoor lighting. And what we can see is that just by using these same devices, these initial devices, we can straight away improve the efficiencies up to 4.4% for bismuth oxy iodide. And that, the significance of that, is that, this is within the range for the industry standard for, for uh, indoor solar cells. Because I guess a lot of you probably would have used a calculator that has a solar panel built into it. If you use that, then you've come across morphous silicon, because that solar panel is probably made from morphous silicon, and morphous silicon is the standard material that's used for the indoor PV industry. And the efficiencies that amorphous silicon has under indoor lighting is between 4.4% and 7%, and they go up to 9.2%, but usually are between 4.4 and 7%. So just with our you know, early results, we can already enter into this range that amorphous silicon has. And this is, bear in mind, this wasn't using our, the best device we ever made. So quite conceivably, there's a realistic possibility that maybe we could make devices that are more efficient than the current industry standard in the future. So we wanted to test whether um, these indoor solar cells could actually do something useful, but can they be used to power uh, IoT electronics? So we, we tested this out using uh, a solution processed inverter. Now just to bring everyone to the same page, an inverter is an electronic knock gate. You would, so one of the you know, most important um, components in uh, um, you know, logic electronics. And an inverter is comprised of two thin film transistors. In this case, these were two uh, carbon nanotube uh, transistors. And you connect the drains of these TFTs together, and that's the output. And you connect the gates together, and that's the input. So a not gate means you put a binary one in, and you get a binary zero out. And for this to work, you have to power the uh, inverter. And we powered that using the uh, indoor solar cell. So we connected the high output into the source for the um, for this TFT and we connected this TFT to the low output, low electrode for our, from a bismuth oxy iodide solar cell. So what you can see is that if we put a high input voltage, we get a low output. And that's because we have um, uh, we have uh, switched off this device so that the output is close in voltage to the ground. And if we use a low input, we switch off this device and switch this TFT on so that output is close to the because uh, the open circuit voltage that we're putting in with our bismuth oxy iodide solar cell. So you can see that our bismuth oxy iodide devices are already sufficient for powering, powering um, these solution processed inverters. We also have a very steep gradient between high and low, and that's very important if you want to use this as a logic processor. Um, and if we plot the gradient here, we get the gain, and the gains are all larger than seven volts per volt, and that's enough for electronic applications. And also when we test um, these um, outputs under different um, light intensities, um, we find that they, they're all re about the same. So, uh, so and this is good because if you imagine imagine yourself wearing a bismuth oxy iodide solar cell on your on your clothing, you walk between different rooms in your house where there are different light intensities. Um, but despite these different light intensities, your um, your your logic device will still work about the same. So that's that's very important for IoT applications. So what's the future potential for bismuth oxy iodide? We have 4.4% right now. Where can go? Can we go in the future? We calculated the optically limited efficiency for bismuth oxy iodide, as well as a range of other materials. And we found out that for bismuth oxy iodide, we can go to efficiencies up to 44%. 
because it has a um, suitable band gap for um, indoor PV applications. So there's a realistic potential that bismuth oxide can exceed the efficiency of amorphous silicon. And uh, we, we, we did this, these calculations for other lead-free perovskite inspired materials. Now, now for these materials, they all sh also share the same challenges as bismuth oxyiodide. They, they are stable, but they have a wide band gap. So their efficiency is under outdoor lighting conditions aren't as high as the perovskites. But here we, we predict that these materials could be a lot more promising for indoor light harvesting by virtue of their wider band gaps. Okay, so very quickly, I want to talk about one of the things that we could do to improve efficiencies in the future. So we did an optical loss analysis, um, and this uh, optical loss analysis for bismuth oxyiodide was done under outdoor lighting conditions. But we also did the same for indoor lighting, and it's very similar. And basically what we um, can learn from this is that the main loss mechanism in our devices is, comes from, um, comes from uh, carriers which are uh, collected, which are absorbed but not collected. So that's this dark gray region here. And we measured the band structure to understand why that was. And we found that uh, we have downwards band bending of bismuth oxyiodide next to the interface with nickel oxide. And this comes about because nickel oxide has a lower work function than bismuth oxide does. And this would impede the extract of holes. It also lead to a space charge region because we're accumulating electrons. And so in the future, we can improve performance by having a higher work function hole transport layer that can eliminate this downwards band bending. So with that, I'd like to sum up. So what we found in this talk, that, that in the work that I showed you, was that bismuth oxide is air stable and it has an ideal band gap for indoor PV applications. And based on this uh, absorption spectrum, we predict that the maximum achievable efficiency is 44% under indoor lighting. We found both computationally and experimentally that this material is tol tolerant towards vacancy and anti-site defects. And our first demonstration of an indoor solar cell, we demonstrated an efficiency of 4.4%. Now, how do we go from this to 44%, well, one of the things we need to do is we need to eliminate the downwards band bending of bismuth oxyiodide next to the whole transport layer. So I'd just like to you know, thank my collaborators uh, on again uh, for their help on this work, and also towards these uh, to these funding sources. Also, thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Robert. That was really, really interesting. And uh, it was uh, a really, really clear presentation. So thank you for that. Um, just a reminder to the audience that you can uh, submit your questions through the Q&A box, which you'll find on the right hand side of your uh, screen and uh, just type your questions in there. and We'll see them. Robert, maybe I, I could get us started and, and just ask, you know, you've spoken um, quite a bit about the, the potential of this material and it sounds like it's it's almost ready for those indoor applications. If you could look into your crystal ball how long do you think it will take before it does become a reality? And could you talk a little bit more about what do you think that the major challenges are to get to that point? Yeah, so I think, you know, um, you know, as, you know whenever you have a new innovation lab, it usually takes about 10 years before you, you know, have it commercialized. In this case, maybe we can accelerate that because there's a lot of interest in PV. There's a lot of investment in solar cells in, in, the, in the industry right now. Um, so, yeah, and also, you know, the IoT industry is a very big industry street right now it says you know so maybe, maybe we can accelerate that process in terms of what we need to do in the future i think for bismuth oxyiodide the key challenge is the reproducibility and that's in terms of the reproducibility of the, of, of the morphology so developing you know scaling up the growth from a lab-based cvd to a, you know maybe more industrial scale cvd and identifying how we could um you know, grow, the, grow these films with a more consistent morphology between different batches. I think this is one of the key challenges right now we need to work on in order to you know, use these for large scale applications you know, commercially. Yeah, but I mean, you know, the, the work we did on you know, bismuth oxide, that was really the first foray of going from perovskite inspired materials for outdoor harvesting through to indoor PV applications. And I think what we showed here was that there's, there's the significant promise of these, um, of these solar cells for harvesting indoor lighting. And we really would encourage the, the broader community working on these, finding these new materials to look into this, this application, which, you know, in which, you know, the, the, the route to commercialization for these new materials that people are developing could be a lot shorter than if they wanted to make them into um, solar cells that you want to put onto a rooftop. 
And at the same time, I would expect that um, you know, this pathway going from you know, new material to indoor PV to maybe a tandem PV or outdoor PV could be um, a route to um, allowing these materials to be commercialized um, more broadly. Um, because once you start commercializing these materials, you build up the, um, the, sc the scale of production for these materials and the investment in these materials. So that you know, could you know, lead to further developments in the performance so that, so that you could you know, put these on, on top of silicon to make a, a tandem that, um, that, make, that, that will be more efficient. So that, that's what I think. OK, that's great. Uh, I, I don't see any questions um, coming in. There is there is one from somebody who's uh, looking for a, for a PhD in, in <laughs> cell efficiency improvements, but maybe we'll, we'll, we'll put them in touch. But yep. uh, <laughs> uh, apart from that, I think uh, that's it. Do you have any other fur further comments that you'd like to make? No, I mean, that, that's it. I mean, I just, just want to say thank you again for you know, the chance to present my work to you, to, to people today. Yeah. That's great. Thank you very much, uh, Robert. And I say that was really, um, really interesting presentation and, and covered a lot. So that that's fantastic. And just a reminder to to you um, uh, watching at home that uh, the series will continue next week, and we turn our our attention back to to wind energy next week, uh, when we'll have Dr. Mosen uh, Lahuti from the Department of Aeronautics, and he's going to be speaking about simulating large wind turbines. Um, in above design wind conditions. So uh, you'll find all the details for that webinar uh, on the Energy Futures Lab website, which is imperial.ac.uk forward slash Energy Futures Lab. So I hope uh, we'll, we'll see some of you again. But uh, for now, thank you very much, Robert, and thank you to everyone who's joined us and have a great afternoon. Bye-bye. Thank you, Connor.